In the fragile motility disorders are defined really based on X-ray or motility testing. But the clinical context is one of chest pain, dysphagia, in the absence of any obstruction. There's a case history to start us off. This is a 36-year-old woman who presents with chest pain occurring occasionally at night, heartburn, regurgitation of food and acid, and a rare trouble swallowing. So she is managed with PPI, told to elevate the head of the bed, and some of the recommendations we talked about when we discussed management of GERD, told to avoid late meals, and she returns two months later and says, I'm not any better. What to do next? Is it an endoscopy, an X-ray, or should we double the PPI dose? None of the above. What to do next is to take a more detailed history, because this is not your classic GERD. There is not even partial improvement. So now you take a more detailed history, and what you find out is that the dysphagia that was in your history initially as rare has actually occurred to solids and liquids equally. It has uh, led to regurgitated food, and when you ask the patient, it looks undigested, therefore it has sat in the esophagus and come up without reaching the stomach. And when she eats, she occasionally reports chest pain. So now you're on the right track because you suspect a motor disorder. So there are key questions to be asked when you're trying to diagnose dysphagia. The first is, is it truly dysphagia? Patient will say, I eat and it sits there. And you translate that as food sticking. In fact, they're describing postprandial fullness. And what I ask patients, I don't say do you have trouble swallowing, because for most patients, swallowing is the voluntary phase. And they will say no, because they don't perceive that the food sticking below in the retrosternal area is actually trouble swallowing. So I say, I ask patients, do you have food sticking? And I always get the answer I'm looking for. The second question is, is this phasia for solids only or liquids or both? Because if it's solids only, it's more li mostly a mechanical cause. <clears throat> is it intermittent or progressive? Uh, again, a stricture will cause uh, uh, sticking of a stake from time to time, whereas achalasia will cause dysphagia on a regular basis and in increasing frequency. And finally, at what level is the obstacle? Now, this is tricky again because for oropharyngeal dysphagia, it is very easy clinically to recognize that the trouble is in the throat. But beyond that, patients will tell you that the food stick in their throat when it's actually stuck at the GE junction because of the referred discomfort. So the other debate is, should we obtain EGD or X-ray first? And those debates go on and on between surgeons and gastroenterologists. And from a practical standpoint, the answer to, my, to me is very simple. If the patient is complaining of solids, food dysphagia only, and it's intermittent, the diagnosis is going to be either a stricture or a cancer or a, or a chaskis ring. And I go for EGD first because not only will I make the diagnosis, but I can apply treatment at the same time and the patient consent can be obtained beforehand. If, on the other hand, patients are complaining now of solids and liquid dysphagia and it's getting worse with time, I would start with an X-ray because it's going to be give me an, an idea of where the obstacle is and if it's a motor disorder, what the esophagus looks like. How do we classify esophageal motor disorders? There are various ways to do it. And the simplest to my mind is to follow the anatomy and the physiology. The esophagus is divided in an upper third, which is striated muscle under our own control, and lower two thirds out of our hands, smooth muscle, and, uh, and a transition zone between the two. So if you separate them this way, you will end up then in two sets of disease. Striated motor disorders are basically what was called in the good old days transfer dysphagia, meaning the transfer of the bolus from the mouse to the esophagus, or what we call today oropharyngeal dysphagia. So the trouble is in the upper part. The patient cannot form a bolus or cannot propel the bolus or chokes on his food. And the causes are multiple. Any neurological disease can do it, trauma can do it, but the major cause is going to be a stroke. 
and you will see this in patients in nursing homes or in hospitals after a stroke. On the other hand, smooth muscle disorders, there are four major categories which we will address. Achalasia, which by far is the more frequent, uh, uh, diffuse spasm, nutcracker esophagus, and scleroderma. So I will say a word about each one of those. Let's start with achalasia. What is it? Achalasia, no movement. It's a peristalsis of the esophagus by definition, not a single peristaltic contraction, poor relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, but the lower esophageal sphincter can be high, pressure can be high or normal. In the old definition of the disease, we insisted on having a high pressure. It does not matter what the pressure you start with, it's the fact that the pressure gradient does not break when you eat. What's the pathogenesis of the disease? All we know is that there is a patchy inflammation of the myenteric plexus of the esophagus with decreased ganglion cells. Therefore, there is a loss of latency gradient across the esophagus because what the myenteric plexus does is make the esophagus, when we swallow, when we initiate a swallow, the esophagus follows in sequence. Number one, two, three, as you go down the esophagus. And when you lose that uh, progression, then the bolus is, uh, it stagnates in the esophagus and leads to aperistalsis. And the defect of inhibitory neurons in the LAS prevents it from relaxing. In other words, when we swallow, we inhibit the tonic contraction of the LAS, and when that doesn't occur, the LAS creates now an obstacle to the passage of the bolus. What about symptoms? Well, achalasia affects all age groups, although there is a, a higher uh, a preponderance in uh, young people in their 20s and 30s, and then a second peak in later years in the 70s. But it affects all age groups. It's typically dysphagia to both solids and liquids with food regurgitation. Chest pain, when we looked at our patients at the clinic, Cleveland Clinic, is present in 40 to 50 percent. Respiratory symptoms have been reported but are fortunately rare and weight loss interestingly is mild. You can actually have obese patients with achalasia and this is a testimony to how patients can really work around that problem to continue to eat. This is a typical x-ray of a patient with achalasia. The esophagus looks atonic. Why? Because you have barium up to the throat, and this is hard to achieve when patient is, is a normal patient is swallowing barium. The esophagus is dilated, and the typical uh, finding is the deformity at the lower esophagus. If you look carefully, you will see the esophagus tapering to what is referred to as the bird uh, beak-like deformity because it's reminiscent of a bird's beak. As time goes by, however, the esophagus becomes more and more dilated, diverticula start to form, and we start referring to this as a sigmoid esophagus. Now, there is a manometric, uh, manometry uh, tracing. This happens to be a normal tracing. And as we look at uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven leads here, uh, ignoring the first, which is really the, the sensor for swallowing, we see as the patient swallows the, f the proximal lead in blue, the pressure decreases. This is the upper sphincter. And then a wave progresses from, the, from proximal to distal with the lower, lowest one, the red one, the red and green, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxing with swallow. And this is a more uh, modern uh, uh, tracing using high resolution manometry, where we have 35 centers throughout, sensors throughout the esophagus, and it's expressed in colors, showing you here the intensity of pressure measured by the color and the progression in time. So these are two normal swallows, they progress nicely down the esophagus. In contrast, this is a patient with achalasia. Now, unlike Two slides away, you see now that the, uh, uh, the progression is not existent. The lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing as nicely. And this is shown better in the next slide, where you have now a straight line coming down, no progression. The esophagus is contracting at the same time, and the lower esophageal sphincter pressure is not dropping.
Now, what's the treatment in achalasia? We unfortunately cannot restore the myenteric plexus. We cannot regenerate the nerves. Our goal is limited really to reducing the gradient of pressure represented by the LES. And this can be achieved with one of few things. We can use a pharmacologic agent such as nitrates or calcium channel blockers to do it. We can forcefully dilate the esophagus endoscopically or surgically by myotomy. And I will say a word about botulinum toxin. Now, this is a slide showing the effect of uh, nitrate and uh, calcium channel blocker on the LES pressure. Once you administer either uh, a calcium channel blocker in, solid, in uh, a broken line or a nitrate in solid line, you will see that the LES pressure decreases significantly and the effect lasts for 40 minutes. So presumably, the patient could take a nitrate under the tongue before eating and for the next half hour, the LES will be open enough to allow the presence of food. Does this work? Yes, it works briefly. Unfortunately, there are common side effects, which particularly in the elderly, namely hypotension, make this not a practical solution. The symptom relief is partial, and in time they stop working. So this, the pharmacotherapy of achalasia really, should be reserved for patients who are ineligible or refuse any other treatment. And frankly, we have not used it much lately. Well, how about pneumatic dilation? Pneumatic dilation is the forceful breakup, actually, of the LES. You cannot achieve that with a Maloney or a Savory dilator, although some patients do report, and there are series, reporting benefit even from Savory dilation. But for more lasting effect, you have to forcefully, forcefully break the fibers of the esophagus. And this is the most uh, uh, available uh, dilator today. Uh, as you can see, there is a balloon. There are markers inside that balloon that will show up fluoroscopically. There are four white spots there. And you can remotely control the pressure of this balloon while looking fluoroscopically to make sure that your balloon is in the right place. So it's an outpatient procedure. It's combined with endoscopy. You need fluoroscopic assistance. And while the technique is variable, there are all kinds of recommendations as to the time and the pressure of the balloon. I think the most uh, prudent thing is to, while looking under fluoroscopy, as the balloon creates a waste at the LES and the LES gets effaced, you stop, you hold it for 30 seconds, and you let down. Now, the perforation, unfortunately, is the main concern with pneumatic dilation. And in the best of hands, it's still 2 to 3%. It's independent of age. I've seen it in young people. I've seen it in 82-year-old people. The role of the technique is questionable. I don't think it's what you do. I think it's the thinness of the esophageal wall. Unfortunately, when it occurs, it's going to require thoracotomy in most patients. And so that's the concern of pneumatic dilation. Surgical myotomy comes up looking better than uh, pneumatic dilation, at least initially. And the misconception is once that you have operated, pneumatic dilation cannot be done. That is not true. We have dilated patients after surgery as well as sent patients who have failed pneumatic dilation to surgery. It's of affected and accompanied by a fund duplication Today, it's, oh, it's done laparoscopically, which imp uh, obviously improves the outcome and makes the hospital stay much shorter. But how, however simple it is, it should be ex done by an experienced surgeon. This is not a surgery to be done by a, thor a thoracic surgeon who has done one before in their lifetime. And this is how it is, it is done. This picture shows uh, the myotomy already done. You see the esophageal mucosa bulging, bulging out. And the surgeon is applying now a fond application with a stitch on the stomach, going around the top of the stomach and then to the esophagus to create what they refer to as a loose fond application. Because if you do too tight a fond application, you have defeated the purpose, of course, of reducing the gradient of pressure. And this is now, the stitches are in place, and the surgeon is about to tie them up. How about botulinum toxin? Unfortunately, 
its uh, ease of administration is so that it has become in the hands of many gastroenterologists the primary treatment and, and this is absolutely wrong. How does it work? It inhibits the release of acetylcholine and therefore decreases the LES pressure significantly up to 60% or more and it's done by injecting 80 to 100 units endoscopically in, in four quadrant fashion around the LES or is slightly above. So you mix the solution and by the way once you've mixed it the shelf life is so short that you do not mix it until the patient shows up because it is expensive. And this is a picture showing how the needle is being inserted through the scope and the medication is being applied around the esophagus. So it's fairly simple to do. But the indication really should be appropriately in elderly frail patients in whom no other treatment is being considered, who are a high surgical risk, who refuse other treatment, or who have pseudoachalasia, which is a condition created by cancer and in whom the, the longevity is going to be very short. It's inappropriate in young patients. It's inappropriate in healthy patients on when the diagnosis is in doubt. Why? Because in long term, botulinum toxin stops working. And if you are going to consider surgery, the surgeon tells us that botulinum toxin causes scarring in the area and apparently makes their surgery more difficult. So the first line of treatment in young healthy patient is not Botox. Okay. Now, how do the two procedures compare? There are unfortunately one maybe controlled study, but most comparative studies are looking at patients over time uh, and they are very imperfect. So what we did at the Cleveland Clinic some years ago is call our patients who had either been treated with pneumatic dilation or myotomy and obtain an x-ray and an interview and we found out that even patients who thought were doing well had actually a failure rate of 67% for myotomy and 74% for pneumatic dilation. So what you have to keep in mind is whatever you do in time, the LES either grows up together uh, or some phenomenon, but the symptoms return. And so what we do with our patient is obtain a timed barium swallow, and I will explain the technique in a minute briefly. And we ask him to come periodically, namely once a year, to have this done. And we ask him how they were doing, and we look at the x-ray as well, in order to stay ahead of the deterioration that occurs over time. And the time barium solo is to give a certain amount of barium. The patient is asked to swallow it quickly over 30 seconds. And <clears throat> up, upright, left posterior oblique position, x-ray at one, two, five minutes. And we measure the width and the height of the barium column. And this use is a, is a simple way of judging gastro esophageal emptying over time by comparing one x-ray to the other year, year after year. So this is an x-ray where at one, two, and five minutes, you can see that the barium hasn't changed. So this is not a good result because at five minutes, there is still a column of barium hanging up. So, how do we approach the treatment of achalasia? I think you have to ask your question, the first question, is the patient a good surgical risk or a poor surgical risk? If it's a good surgical risk, I go to laparoscopic myotomy because it is a great improvement on thoracic uh, myotomy. It, it is, although there are complications, they are controllable. So if the patient fail, we can go to pneumatic dilation. If they fail, Unfortunately, only esophagectomy is, is uh, the last recourse. If, on the other hand, pneumatic dilation is chosen and it fails, you can always go to surgery. And if it succeeds, you can repeat it two or three years from now. If it's a poor surgical risk, on, other, on, uh, on the other hand, this is when I start, start with Botox. If it succeeds, you repeat it as needed. And most patients will need it every six months to a year. If it fails, on the other hand, you can repeat it again. And if it fails again, then you are left to either palliation or reconsidering again intervention and assessing the risk and seeing if the patient can, uh, can uh, uh, su submit to surgery or to pneumatic dilation. A word about diffuse esophageal spasm. It's a clinical entity expressed by dysphagia, chest pain, 
spastic contraction, but in the presence of peristaltic contraction. And this is a main distinction with achalasia, where there is absolutely no peristalsis. So this is a tracing of a patient with diffuse spasm. And the first swallow you see on the left is normal. The second one, in contrast, as you can see, the contraction is not peristaltic. It is much stronger, and it lasts much longer. And this is expressed by high-resolution manometry. Again, you can see the stark contrast between the first and the second swallow. Now, on X-ray, you will see this tertiary contraction, and there are various names for it. Corkscrew esophagus, rosary bead esophagus, etc., etc. What I want to emphasize is seeing this is not uncommon in elderly patients, but they're not symptomatic. So you cannot make the diagnosis of, a, of diffuse esophageal spasm on X-ray alone. You need the clinical context. And you cannot either tell elderly patients that it's okay to have dysphagia. The workup of dysphagia in elderly patients is just as important. Now, Diffuse non-cardiac chest pain has been touted as a major cause of esophageal problem. In fact, it's not true. This is an old study taking 100 patients with non-cardiac chest pain, they already seen the cardiologist, come to your clinic and you suspect the esophagus. You do a motility testing and as you can see in blue, about 72% have a normal motility. Only 28% have abnormal motility. Of these 28%, 48% have not cracked esophagus, which I will talk about uh, shortly. Non-esophageal, uh, non-specific motor disorder, about the third, 36% in purple. Only 10%, the orange quadrant, 10% have diffuse spasm. So it's 10% of 28%. So if you take, again, 100 patients with non-cardiac chest pain, only 2 to 3% have diffuse spasm. So it's not such a common condition. The nutcracker esophagus was recognized about 20 years ago, and it's a manometric entity. It's defined by high amplitude, higher than 180 millimeters of mercury on average in the distal esophagus, with a duration of more than 60 seconds. The contraction, by definition, are peristaltic. There is no diffuse spasm here. And it's been uh, one of the differential diagnoses of chest pain. It turns out with time, and this is an example of nutcracker esophagus. The contractions look wild, but they progress. The food is progressing. There may be dysphagia rarely, but usually there isn't. And this is a uh, depiction in high-resolution manometry of this weird contraction, but it moves down. I think we all agree today that nutcracker esophagus is just a manometric variant, probably an epiphenomenon seen in patients with reflux, but frankly, as a, as a uh, standing entity by itself, clinically at least, I don't think it's terribly important. Scleroderma, on the other hand, is uh, obviously quite a, pro a distressing disorder, and it affects the esophagus by creating an inadequate LES with a distal loss of peristalsis. And this is an image of uh, an esophagus with scleroderma. As you can see, it's an absolutely atonic esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter is almost non-existent down in orange and green. And if you depict that in high resolution manometry, it looks like nothing is happening. So uh, what is my approach to dysphagia or an esophageal motor disorder? If the patient is complaining of what sounds typically as oropharyngeal or transfer dysphagia, we should start with a video esophagram. If you find that you were wrong and there is a structural abnormality, then you refer the patient to ENT. If, on the other hand, it's a neuromuscular disorder, a physiologic one, then you obtain a neurologic evaluation. At the end of the day, your speech slash swallowing therapist is going to be the most helpful uh, in, in treating the disorder. If, on the other hand, it's an esophageal dysphagia and it's solids alone, you proceed to endoscopy. If it's solids and liquids, obtain an esophagram, it's normal, proceed to manometry. It's abnormal, it's a structural disorder, you go to EGD. If it's neuromuscular, you proceed to manometry. So, my take-home message is that dysphagia deserves attention at any age,
X-ray and EGD reliably and effectively predict most cases, and a carefully obtained history is absolutely essential. Thank you.